We found West Brookfield to be a charming town with a population of less than 4,000 people on 21 square miles of land. There was lots of farmland and a nice downtown area with a beautiful park that included a unique war memorial and a lovely fountain. We are with Amy Dugas, and she is the president of the Quaybog Historical Society and also runs the museum here yep. in West Brookfield. Yep. So tell us about the history of uh, West Brookfield, and it's all tied in with all of the Brookfields, right? It, yes, it is more or less. Um, the history of old Brookfield, if you will, started on Foster Hill in West Brookfield um, when a group of men from Ipswich petitioned the courts to be granted a tract of land to settle. That was in 1660. They were granted that piece in 1665, so that's our earliest settlement in West Brookfield, 1665. And it's on a beautiful parcel of land with beautiful sweeping views of the area. And um, a group of people, small, maybe 12 <coughs> families or something, lived up there until King Philip's War in 1675 when the native people interacted with them and burned the colony down, at which point they went back to Ipswich. Didn't come back to our area till 16, well, it was 13 years after that, so 1686 or something like that. Okay. And at that point then, the area was starting to take off. So Foster Hill wasn't the, necessarily the main settlement anymore. It was beginning to disperse around the Quaybog Plantation, which encompasses six towns, actually. Okay. Warren and New Braintree are part of the group. Okay. That we consider the Quaybog Plantation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, why did people come out here? Was it for farming? For farming, um, it was a good spot in between Boston and Springfield. Okay. It was a lot of rich farmland. You had the Quaybog River. Um, yeah, I'd say agriculture and just to get away from you know, create their own, their own land, their own colony. Yeah. Yeah. And so then over the years, things changed where the towns kind of broke off. Is that right? Yeah. As settlement grew and more people were coming out, then it just, they would populate in North Brookfield. They would populate in Brookfield. At which point, as we spoke of earlier, that's when they were setting up these different precincts, if you will, where they could practice their religion and politics within their own community and not have to travel by horse miles and miles and miles to services and what have you. Right. Yeah. So over the years, they all got incorporated yep. into separate towns. Yep. And different years, different towns were incorporated. Our, our earliest, I mean, our latest one is East Brookfield. I think they're 1921. Whereas I think we are, I don't know, I'd say Maybe we're in the 1800s. I don't know. I can't recall when West Brookfield was incorporated, but every town was incorporated at a different point in history. Okay. Yeah. But That's I'd like nice. to say we still function kind of very well as a unit. And this museum in particular incorporates all six towns. The other ones more so incorporate their own individual community. But that makes this one, I think, a little unique because each town has its own little spot to highlight. Oh, excellent. Yep. Yeah. <laughs>
Wesley at the Miniature Horse Farm, or one of them. Yes. Yeah. And tell me all about how this all came about. Sure. So my father moved to West Brookfield in 1973, uh, purchased the farm up the road. And uh, we had big horses at that point. Uh, we didn't purchase our first Mini until 1980. My father was reading the Wall Street Journal one day and saw an ad for miniature horses and thought he should go check it out. And that's how it started. So 40 something years later, we're still doing it. So tell me when you say what you're doing, you have miniature horses mm -hmm. and you breed? We do, we breed them, uh, we raise them, we keep the ones we want to show, uh, we sell the others. And I mean, there's all kinds of disciplines for them. There's jumping, there's driving, there's halter. Uh, you can buy pet quality, you can buy show quality. There's all price points. There's horses for all ages. So it's pretty much whatever somebody wants, we can, we can help them out. And when you sell them, what are they usually, are they usually for show or are they just uh, pets? So most, of them, most of them are pets. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably the minority is for show. And your horses are shown, right? They are, yep, and they're all over the country. Sounds like, tell us some of the places that you've gone. So right now my sister and her boyfriend are in Ocala, Florida. Uh, then he comes home for a week, then he goes down to Williamston, North Carolina. <laughs> uh, then he'll go to a show in Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Kentucky. Then he heads to Oklahoma and Texas. Wow. So he's wow. on the road for, yeah, he is. for probably two months out of the summer. And is he the one that does the training with the animals? Uh, so he does his own. He has his own business, and then my sister trains our horses. Horses. Yep. So they're both trainers. They are, yeah. They yep. do the same kind of, uh, do, are they, um, do they do it differently? Do they uh, uh, are they, pretty they, much the same? They, they all have their own techniques. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Clinton's from a different school. Christina's uh, self-taught for the most part. So they they do it similarly, similarly but differently. So. And so how many... Uh, mares are pregnant right now. So at our farm we have uh, six, uh, four babies on the ground. There's six more to come and then my sister has three more to full and she has the one on the ground here. And, so and tell me how... There could be a total of 14 between both farms. After they conceive, how long until the birth? Uh, typically 11 months. Wow. I, I think so we you, feel you got, sorry for the horses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you definitely have to be patient. So. Now you got it. me cornered. I don't yeah. know if I, I'm trusting this group. <laughs> I just love the way they the prance. Yeah, so they yeah. really prance. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm she's running go back. back to her I'm going to go see my mom. I'll be all right. <laughs>
yes. it works for us. Well, at the moment, we are, um, I just signed contracts to redo sprinklers upstairs. Okay, so so at, at the moment, it would be for big events, but um, as soon as that is completed, which contractors work at their own pace, <laughs> so whenever, whenever that is, um, we will roll out the new rooms. We just want to make sure that we're up to code and as things happen and we can afford to increase the safety of the building, we certainly want to do that. Absolutely. So you have a restaurant, and tell us about that. Um, we do. We are open seven days a week from 11.30 to 9, or 11.30 to whenever um, our last customers decide it's time to leave. And we do a lot of functions, showers, birthday parties, weddings, anniversaries, um, that sort of thing here. So. Wow. And how did you get into this? What did you do before this? Uh, well, I was in the construction business and she was in the pharmaceutical business and we had bought two years prior to that a Subway sandwich shop down the street. So <laughs> we started frequent this place to have a drink at the end of the day and it was one night all of a sudden she said we're gonna buy this place <laughs> and there it is. And we you said yes dear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep and we've been married 44 years so yes dear is the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, the rest is history. We've just you know been here since and um, in 1938 to 1942, in this very room that you're sitting, they had a program called Cocktails and Chopped Ice. And it was literally um, when refrigeration was just becoming a big deal. And you can see it on the newspaper over there after. And um, they had pipes come up and they froze a section of the inside of this room. And they actually did ice skating and ice twirling. And oh I personally gosh. have met one of the skaters. <laughs> and many people who actually were here to see the shows. And they did that from 1938 to 1942. Um, wow. it's, it's just been a great history of bringing the community together, sharing the tavern, and having people in, and um, you know, just making everybody at home. I gotta put my big mouth around. Oh, mm, very good fish. My time. What do you have there, Beth? It helps to turn it on first. Mark. I know. I'm so fat, you know. Certain things are hard. I have fish tacos, and they've got a, this great slaw on it, and it looks delicious. I'm going to take a big bite. Mmm. Very tasty. Kick at the end. I love it. You've got to try the fish tacos here. We're here with Rebecca, Rebecca Fay <laughs> at the Westbrook Westbrook Field. Westbrook Field Frame and Art or Art and Frame? Art and Frame. frame. Okay. <laughs> I got it out. <laughs> Anyhow, tell us um, <laughs> when that you started this business or started the shop? Uh, well, the shop has a long history. It's about a 50, probably almost 60 year old business now that originated as Worcester Art and Frame um, and was in Worcester for many, many years when I bought it and had it there for, gosh, I can't remember the actual dates, but probably about four or five years I was there. And then the, when the economy tanked in 2008, Mm -hmm. I moved it home. We had just built a big barn here in town uh, on our property. And so I moved it home, kept some corporate clients, and had another baby at 42. <laughs> and then uh, once I got him into kindergarten is pretty much when I started it here, which we just started our eighth year here in West Brookfield as a, a frame shop sure. and art gallery. But I, I, when I originally came here, uh, a friend of mine had this space as her studio. She's a prolific artist, um, lamp, torch work, glass, um, oh, she, she does okay. um, beads and um, and pretty much every other medium, but she had this as a half gift shop and her studio on the other half, hoping, you know, one would take care of the other, and then I joined her, we worked together for about a year, and then when she left, I, uh, I had this big space, and really all I needed was the counter to take framing orders, uh, because I have my, my space, my workshop at home, I came up with the idea of uh, a gallery space, but not in the traditional sense, in that most galleries will, will take 50% commission on work. Here, 
I charge a, a very small annual fee for the artist. It, it works out to, you know, it's like under, it's about $45 a month they pay annually. And they take 100% of their sales. Oh, wow. So That is unusual. Yeah, well, it's, we're in a small town, very small town, beautiful town, but very small. And uh, it's not a big touristy place. You know, if I were in Provincetown or right. you know, Northampton or yeah. Boston, you know, some place that's got a big art you know collector clientele to be a different story but but out here it just allows me to put a little money in the coffers at the beginning of the year and then work from there my money it comes from your frames the, the framing which is a kind of a luxury these days to have things custom framed but uh they're still they're still doing it <laughs> well that's good that's yeah. good yeah there's a lot of collectors you, you would be surprised um, okay. um, around. And, and not that they would necessarily buy all their art here, though art sales are pretty good. A um, lot of things, a lot of things need picture framing, redoing, you know, and, and it's not always art. Sometimes it's, you know, collectibles and you know, three dimensional things and, and fun projects too. And do you do any art? I do. I'm an artist. Um, I went to Mass Art in Boston. Uh -huh. I went to Wachusett Regional High School in Holden. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, there was an English teacher there, Mr. Reynolds, whose wife had a frame shop in Holden. She was looking for someone to, you know, a high school student to come in and maybe she would train and, you know, she just needed a little help. And so out of the art department, I was selected um, by my teacher, Charlene Wilcox, to go do that. And I've, skill, I've, nice I've probably framed in, I don't know, 20 different shops throughout Massachusetts and Boston. And uh, yeah, why not have my own, right? Post and Boot is a cute little antique shop in West Brookfield, owned by our new friend, Barbara Rossman. We're with Jay Horgan, and he's the owner of the Quay Bog Bookshop. Bookshop in West Brookfield, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. How long have you owned the bookshop? Um, I've owned the store for about seven years. Okay. Yep. And what was it before that? Uh, before I owned it, it was the Book Bear. It had been here since 1979. The original owner, Al Nowitzki, had owned it the whole time, and um, I worked with him for a few years, and then bought it from him when he was ready to retire. Okay. What did you do before that? A lot of different things. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> I spent several years uh, working for uh, Borders Books. So, okay. So I had some experience with the book industry and the new book business. Um, and I came here and decided to work with Al to see what the old book business was um, and decided I liked it enough to buy the store. So. Excellent. What draws you to a bookshop or being a bookshop owner? Well, I mean, I like to read and I collect books myself. So. It tends to be you know, the ideal book uh, job is doing what you love. So, absolutely, that's excellent. So, what do you have here? It looks like you have a very high volume of books. Yeah, it's a general shop. We have about 110 to 120 thousand books in the store in oh pretty goodness. much every category. I mean, we try to carry a little bit of everything. Um, we're probably a little heavy on fiction, New England history, and military history, uh, but. Most categories are represented by a fair number of books. Okay, and they're not all new, are they? Uh, there's nothing that's new really in the store. Oh, uh, okay. Everything is used. Um, the, there is one exception for a local author that, that is up on the front table that we buy them new from him because they're all about, about the uh, um, Quabbin Reservoir, and that's a popular thing in this area. So we do buy those from him, but that's the only new thing in the store. Excellent. Okay, so where do you get the books? 
almost everything we have was bought from people's personal collections. So when people are moving or downsizing or just cleaning out, um, they give us a call and we go and take a look at their collection and go through it and make an offer on the material and bring it down here and clean it, price it, put it out. Oh, so you'll do like bulk? Yeah, bulk. we've bought, I mean, we've bought as many as, well, the previous owner had bought over 100,000 books at one time with me. Um, since then, I think the biggest one we did is about 30,000, uh, but it's mm. still a lot of books. Okay. So the, do they need to be like antiques or? No, nope, we carry a little bit of everything. We do, we do rare and antique books, uh, but it's not our primary business. Our primary business is just reading copies for people who want to read and collect. Um, and so it's mostly, the price point in the store is relatively reasonable. Uh, we do have some collectible material, but it can be anything from just old school books to, you know, modern classics. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have some old HTML books. I'd like to get rid of. <laughs> HTML, huh? <laughs> we'd, we'd probably buy them. <laughs> Who comes in here? Everybody, or is, do you have more collectors than just people off um, the street? It's a mix. Uh, our, as far as like where they come from, our, our local is maybe, it's probably only about 15% of our business is local. Um, the rest comes from New Hampshire, Vermont, the rest of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, even New York. Um, oh. we, hit, we get dealers in from New York City and um, Maine and various other places and uh, we get shoppers in from all over the place, particularly on weekends. We tend to be busier on the weekend than during the week because we're more of a destination shop. the Salem Cross Inn mm -hmm. with, and I'm not going to try to pronounce your name because okay. as Beth knows, I'll mess it up. That's fine. Okay. I'm Evan Liaska. I'm one of many managers here. Um, so I fill in wherever we need, but I will, uh, through, through the winter months from November until the end of April, I'll do the fireplace cooking for our fireplace feasts. Oh, you do? Yes. So we have feasts through the winter, but we also have four summer feasts coming up as well, which is interesting. So, and this has been kind of Part of your life exactly that, I grew up here yep <laughs> and I know that your family is all intertwined and all have certain roles yes. in this everything in the kitchen is made from scratch we can accommodate any allergy um, you know gluten-free options you know about 80% of the menu uh, we can we can accommodate pretty much any allergy uh, everything's is uh, fresh local as much as we can um, and just good food, yeah. So I got one question. You said mm -hmm. something about your gardens. Do you have yes. huge gardens? Uh, I it's didn't not say enormous, but um, we do have a production garden as well as an heirloom herb garden. My Uncle John, as I <laughs> keep mentioning, uh, he started up the, the gardens for us. And I mean, it's not just vegetables and herbs. Uh, it's also plenty of uh, flowers contemporary to the time as well. Wow. wow. A couple of uh, uh, non-native plants as well, like dahlias are my Aunt Nancy, who is our general manager, her favorite. And they're beautiful additions to the, uh, uh, the ambiance yes, for the, are, the brides they and They are beautiful, yes. <laughs> Summer, we do a lot of outdoor dining. Um, we, we'll bring things fresh from the garden, which is always, uh, can't be fresh from the garden. No, you can't, you can't. <laughs> and we do a lot of herb cooking because we have endless supplies of herbs out there. Well, that's, that's even better. We probably yeah. have about 50 different varieties. Do you really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. The barn is all original. Uh, the post and beam is uh, made of chestnut and all of the other material is uh, varieties of pine. So the floorboards are all original, yellow and white pine. These uh, pediments, these actually come from the First National Bank of Boston. They were taking these down from the bank and planning on just discarding them. And my grandfather asked if he could have them. And they said, yes, as long as you have them out of here within an hour. Oh my so goodness. Somehow he was able oh. to get them from Boston <laughs> to West Brookfield all within an hour. <laughs> wow. People think it's Crofts, but the, that's just an old English S. Um, Okay. It, it is Salem Cross Inn. 
So we're walking into the kitchen or the hearth of the original house. Um, the most notable feature is the uh, wood paneling. So notice how some of these boards are over two feet wide. Um, I, yes. Especially the ones on the end here. Um, those are the, the widest of all the boards. So this is what wow. you would call pumpkin pine. It's an old growth pine, and this is not stained wood either. This no. is the natural patina of the wood. So wow. my grandfather would bring eight people in every January and treat these boards with a mixture of turpentine and uh, linseed oil. So this is the original doors. No, with the bullet. Exactly, so the bullseye style glass. glass. So that dates the doors. Um, this was common in the uh, 16th, 17th, or 17th, 18th centuries. Um, but you'll notice they're uh, double cross doors. Uh, this is what we named the restaurant after. This is called the Salem Cross or the Salem Hex Mark. Uh, this is the original um, door latch of the front and of the house. And that's called? A Salem Cross. The idea is it would keep evil spirits from entering the home. Uh, it dates back to the days of witchcraft. And if you would have that on your front door, it would protect you from witchcraft. Oh, Except it's even better in person, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> and this weight? Yeah, so this is solely powered by the, the hanging weight there. Solely powered by mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So say we lost power in a storm, we're still able to cook this prime rib. Wow. That is really something. Yeah. So this, this uh, beam right here, this is uh, American chestnut. So that's how it's able to withstand these kinds of temperatures. And that's never been, well, no, it hasn't been changed. Because right. Because the way it's built in. So this wasn't, this fireplace is the only thing that wasn't originally here, as well as the bar. Um, <laughs> the bar wasn't there, no. <laughs> right, the bar was not there. Um, how long does it take to do the... Uh, yeah, how long do you... Do you every like, time's a bit different, but on average, right around three hours. Two and a half, three hours. Oh, and yeah. how often do you do this? So, we'll do this for a wedding. We'll do a uh, special type of wedding if that's what's requested. But uh, we do the fireplace feasts. Uh, they start in the beginning of November and they run through the end of April. And we'll do that Friday, Saturday night, Sunday afternoon. I bet you're sold out. Too. Oh, yeah. They sell out about two, two to four months in advance. And that's not <laughs> weddings. Right. No. Wow. <laughs> yeah, those are uh, the tickets released to the public. But you can always make your special day using the prime rib here, too, which is nice. This roasting jack, it's estimated date that it was handmade back in England in 1680. Uh, the individual who made this would have had to have been both a master blacksmith as well as a master clocksmith. So this is all cast iron. And then in the back, we have clock gears. But all of these gears would have been hand filed until it worked just right. So it took my grandfather 10 years of, of like persistent searching before he was able to find this exact model. Where did, where did he find it? He found this in upstate Maine. Are you, are you in heaven? It's warm. Is it? It's just like melting in my mouth. Tasty, you have that tartness from the rhubarb. And the sweetness is a little crumble top. This is in homemade whipped cream. This is heaven. Oh wow. my god. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I might just have to video you all night eating it. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs>